Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our webcast, Funding for the UK's Community Energy Sector, What are the Opportunities and Challenges? In this webcast, Matthew Hannon, Senior Lecturer and Director of Research at Strathclyde Business School and colleagues from the UK Energy Research Centre's Financing Community Energy Project, outline their findings on how projects have been financed to date, how community energy groups are innovating now, and the opportunities and challenges ahead. If you have any questions during the live presentation, please use the online function to submit these. I hope you enjoyed today's webcast and I'll now hand you over to Matthew. Okay, thank you very much, Heather. Um, welcome, everybody. I can see people are slowly kind of uh, dialing in. So I don't know whether, Heather, you just want to hold on for one moment. Um, of course. Just, just for other people to, I can see people were uh, dialing in very, as, as you were just introducing there. If that stabilizes, then we can just kick off. Maybe it has. Okay, Look, looks like it probably has. So how about I just do introductions anyway? So yeah, um, welcome everybody. Um, my name is Dr. Matthew Hannon. What I'll do is uh, just share my slides um, with you all so you can see them on the screen. Uh, there we go. And I'll put it to the first slide. Excellent. So I, I don't have sight of uh, who's dialing in and what have you, Heather. So if there's any issues, please just uh, please just shout. I'd also like to just before I introduce myself, introduce my colleagues um, from the universities of uh, Manchester and also uh, where I'm from, the University of Strathclyde. We've got Ed Edward Manderson and Ian Cairns, who are colleagues who've helped undertake this research. So thank you very much for dialing in too. Um, so just a little bit of background about myself and who I am. Uh, so I'm a senior lecturer um, and director of research at the Hunter Centre for Entrepreneurship at Strathclyde Business School. So we're based up in Glasgow um, and we conduct research mainly into um, what sort of supports entrepreneurship, innovation and also looking at issues around strategy and organisation. So uh, a lot of overlap with, uh, I'm assuming, many of your interests. My personal research looks at uh, how government policy can support both energy business model and technolo technology innovation for a net zero transition. So we're looking at new types of business models, um, and that's mostly what we'll be talking about today, but we've also conducted various research about how um, we can support, government can support uh, technology innovation, so don't work on wave power and floating wind and the like. Um, I wear a few other hats and I, I may make reference to those as we go through. I think it's important just to disclose these at the outset. So I'm a member for Scottish Power Energy Network's Customer Engagement Group, and we are a, a independent body uh, that look to um, inform and critique Scottish Power's uh, five-year business plan, which will be submitted to the regulator off GEM. Um, specifically relevant to today's lecture is the fact that I, I work with South Seeds, an organ community organization that um, operates across the south side of Glasgow. Um, and so I, I've had firsthand experience of the challenges these community groups face um, and also work with the Green Angel Syndicate who look to invest in, in early stage business ideas, typically technologies and the like. So just a bit of background about my myself there. So I think it's, it's important to... Um, state from the outset you know why why on earth are we even talking about community energy um, many will regard this as a as a niche undertaking in the context of uh, delivering a net zero transition um operating you know at a relatively sort of decentralized scale um and something that is kind of bottom up and grassroots rather than a, a top down um you know centralized initiative so in many respects there's a lot counting against the role of community energy in delivering a net zero transition. And what do I mean by that? Well, I mean, uh, effectively, uh, you know, net zero emissions by 2050 in the UK, which is now inscribed in, in law, um, and which is where we are hoping to move towards. So, so what, what is the role? Well, um, it really attaches its, itself primarily to the context of a just transition. Some of you uh, may be familiar with this, though, for those of you who are not, this is, uh, a, an agenda which has emerged alongside the net zero um, agenda, which looks at essentially ensuring that we leave no section of society behind. Now that may it relate to jobs, it may relate to uh, the people who, who share the costs associated with a, a net zero transition, but no single section of society is, is left behind whilst, for instance, others, others um, gain at their, uh, their, um, uh, you know, at their expense. So 
the other element i guess to this in terms of a just transition is why what is what is important uh, about delivering on our net zero ambitions. So the graphs on the right hand side there really point to how we've been most successful in delivering emissions reductions in the power sector. Um, and uh, we can see that there on, on the, uh, the left hand figure there about how that's dropped dramatically. And most of those decisions have been made by large corporations, which have been underwritten by state subsidy. And really what we find is they haven't involved the consumer, you and I, and they haven't demanded them to fundamentally change how they behave. Now, where we look at where emissions are most stubborn, uh, we can find there, particularly in the context of surface transport, which is now the largest single emitting uh, sector, but also buildings, where we know, you know how we get to work, how we heat our homes. Those are our decisions. Um, and really, to get to net zero, we need to, we need to fundamentally change how we do that. So we need consumers to act now and we need to bring them aboard. And this is something that the, the Committee on Climate Change, um, as part of their net zero uh, report, have emphasized that you know, the majority of these emissions reductions uh, rely on behavioral change. And we can see that there, those are the uh, emissions they're grayed out and also um, green. So we can't just rely on tech to provide passive solutions. I think this is quite fundamental. One of the last sort of background slides here is how um, how in, how fundamental this change will be to us as individuals in our households. And these are the the changes on the left, 2017, and on the right are the emissions uh, by 2050 and what is expected uh, as an as a net zero transition. And we can see a fundamental change around how we heat our homes, how we uh, transport, how we even how we eat our our, uh, our meals. So just to emphasize here that now we are looking to your average uh, citizen to fundamentally change how, how they behave. And this is where community energy kind of slots in. It's extremely important in delivering a just transition. First and foremost, it's critical to public support uh, in the sense that um, it, it can help if applied correctly to support the agenda around social justice. So that's fair treatment of all people in society. And a big focus here is on the fair distribution of costs and benefits across society. But more specifically, uh, um, in the context of community energy, where you are enabling communities to take their, uh, take their own decisions, um, take the power into their own hands around how they satisfy their energy needs, it's around procedural justice. So they, they feel that they have control over the decision-making process that shapes the energy system. And in doing so, we can help communities to take ownership of this transition but also enable them to shape the solutions to better meet their needs. And I think we're gonna hear more and more about this in the context of a just transition, about giving citizens the necessary control that they demand to be able to get on board with the fundamental behavioral changes that we require. So in this context, we, we now move into community energy. And before we, we talk about the results from our study, it's just really important to understand why we ended up doing this work. Traditionally, community energy in the UK has been around delivering uh, decentralised and democratically owned renewable power generation. And this has been underpinned in large part by government subsidy. So many of you will have heard of the feed-in tariff, um, and this provided uh, two streams of, of, uh, of tariff. One was a generation tariff, so however much power you generated, for instance, from rooftop solar, you would get a certain number of pence per kilowatt hour and also an export tariff. So any, any spare power that you wanted to put, put, put back into the grid, you get money. And these stabilized revenues over a long, long uh, time period, 20 years plus, and in doing so they de-risk projects and that and then enable communities to bring other money in because investors saw this as, a, as, a, as an investable and de-risked solution in that context. And here on the right-hand side, we can see how community energy generation really took off um, during the 2010s. And even in, with the announcement in 2019 that the feed-in tariff was gonna be cut, we saw an increase in that year. This was mostly because people were chasing the deadline and wanted to make sure um, they had everything in place to, to, to gather that subsidy. And there are big questions about whether this, this um, this increase will continue. So 
we saw the closure of the feed-in tariff in 2019. We saw the removal of tax relief for schemes like SEIS, EIS, SITR. These tend to be tax breaks on investment that you make uh, in, in different types of organizations and initiative. We saw the end of major grant schemes, such as the Urban Community Energy Fund. And again, most of you will have heard of the effective ban on onshore wind that we had. Um, and whilst this has been partially lifted uh, with onshore wind now becoming um, or hope to be included in 21 um, for the uh, contracts for difference, planning restrictions around it are extremely stringent. So community energy has been having to navigate this space and it has really hurt its prospects. And the expectation from Community Energy England is on the basis of these barriers that we can see in this pie chart on the right, most of which we can see in the top right hand corner is the closure of the feed-in tariff, that they expect 2020 to be the leanest year um, in living memory for, for community energy uh, without any major um, and, and very quick change to the policy landscape. Now, the community energy sector has responded to this uh, with aplomb. Um, uh, and I say the community energy sector, I mean not only community energy organisations, but, but those organisations around them. And largely this has been around experimenting with new and more complex business models and finance mechanisms. Um, the, way, the way I kind of think of it in, in my head is that you, it's almost like a migration of, you know, whatever wild animal you want to choose here, but migrating from one, one area to another where pastures are greener, okay? And this is what's kind of happening with the community energy uh, sector, is they're being forced to migrate into a new territory around uh, being able to monetize uh, services. So we'll talk a bit more about that later. Um, but this is where, in the context that our project was, was funded, so financing community energy, funded by the UK Energy Research Centre, so colleagues, Ed and Ian, were both funded through this, and it was an, an initiative between uh, three universities led by Manchester, including Strathclyde and also Imperial College. And we wanted to explore, you know, what types of new business models and finance um, could be adopted by communities to deliver um, profitable and successful projects in a low subsidy world, and then what kind of policies could, could help these flourish. I'm not, in, I don't intend to go through this slide at all in detail. I just want to emphasize just what a big undertaking this was. Um, so in terms of uh, coverage around background documentation, um, then work package one, we've the survey, which will mostly be what we focus on here. We covered uh, up to 145 projects across nearly 50 organizations. Um, we'll also talk a bit about case studies, um, and these were on the basis of four different organizations um, and stakeholder workshops about what the future looks like. Links to all of these will, can be found at the back of the slide pack, and I hope Heather can uh, circulate these after, um, but we can, we, we can point to, to the evidence as, as required. Okay, so in, into the results. Um, so I think the, the first thing to say, when we took this, this survey um, a couple of years ago, um, the, the sector um, was very much dominated by renewable electricity generation. The majority of the projects here we can see on the, on the left, mostly on-site community renewables, rooftop solar. Um, and if we look at the, the capex, obviously that starts to shift much more into standalone uh, renewables, uh, onshore wind, uh, hydro and the like. And in terms of how these were financed, um, on-site customer renewables, mostly solar rooftop, uh, largely financed by community shares. Standalone renewables, these kind of slightly larger projects might be a, a one or two wind turbines, maybe a ground mounted solar farm, uh, much more sort of mixed arrangements. Uh, so you may see uh, loans, uh, grants, bonds, uh, as, as well as shares. And then we saw a very small number of demand side energy saving projects. So these aren't generating power. They're looking to uh, improve uh, the well-being of customers by, uh, for instance, increasing levels of efficiency. And these, a lot of these were either grant funded or cross subsidized from renewables. So you had an organization where the income was being drawn in from, from renewables generation and then being spent on efficiency measures. So the finance mix um, also depended largely on the size of the project. So grants accounted for a small fraction of project costs, which is unsurprising given how these grant, um, these grant schemes fell by the wayside um, as of, sort of 2010 onwards and were, and were replaced with long-term revenue 
payments like the feed-in tariff, like the renewable heat incentive. And we're saying that we will see a reversal of that now, uh, largely in the heat sector over the coming years. And I can pick that up in the Q&A. Um, size of the capital expenditure also depended on, uh, sorry, the size of the capital expenditure also influenced the finance mix. mix. So we can see here on the right-hand side, how the smaller projects, those um, less than £200,000 of CapEx, were largely community shares. So you were able to draw money in from, from the local area or maybe beyond through uh, sort of crowdsourcing efforts and bringing that in community shares. As the project got bigger, they were less able to do that and ha had to brought money, bring money in from other sources, uh, maybe loans, also bonds here we see in that kind of middle range. And then the larger projects, those 1.5 million and above, uh, were, were uh, bringing in majority uh, loan finance. Um, and we can see that in the bo bottom left here, the threshold of the project around 200,000 pounds in size. So 88% of pro generation projects above this threshold use some kind of loan finance. Um, and uh, I, I won't unpack these but our case studies that linked at the back there talk in fine detail about the types of money that these organizations have brought in how much and also exactly why they chose to bring that that finance in um so community shares very much a recurring story in this and seem to be a reaction from the community energy sector as a whole trying to fill um uh, in, in the absence of grants, but in, in the presence of long-term revenue payments, such as the feed-in tariff, they were able to fill a big chunk, particularly for the smaller projects, a big chunk of that capex with community shares. Now, it's worth noting that these are you know, quite different from withdrawable shares, not transferable, no capital gains. Um, we can also see things like a cap of £100,000 from any single community shareholder. So there's there's quite a few kind of unique characteristics to these, which must be understood uh, before you know any any share offer is raised. Um, and crucially, what what we found as well is that, and if I just press this going forward here, um, I see community shares actually offered some of the cheapest finance available across the board in terms of different uh, finance mechanisms. So. Um, average interest rate um, of 4.6% versus loans at 5.6 and bonds at 5. Um, and we can also see just the, the, the level of finance that we were able to, to pinpoint from, from community shares. So, so not, just, um, not just able to cover the majority of costs for smaller projects, but also relative, relatively cheaply compared to other forms of, of finance. Another thing that came up time and time again was the importance of legal structures. So in a large part, this was important because it influenced the type of finance that communities can raise. So for instance, community interest companies limited by shares are only able to raise ordinary or transferable shares, uh, whilst cooperatives can, can raise uh, only community withdrawable shares. Um, so we, you know, in, in this sense, communities were selecting uh, particular particular types of legal structure to satisfy their their targeted type of finance but in doing so there were there were also other issues to consider so um you know you you had to look and i'm looking at the bottom two uh, bullet points here the other if, in, other influences were around how that organization is governed so different legal structures meant uh, uh, you know implications around whether you got one share versus uh, sorry one share equaled one vote or whether it was one shareholder one vote and that has a fundamental impact upon not just the balance of power but also how equitable that, the, the governance arrangements of that organizations are um, and then uh, other issues around things like asset locks and, and the extent to which um, the community is exposed to risk should the the organization um, uh, enter some uh, financial troubles And again, just to reiterate that a lot of this finance was only forthcoming because of the a combination of how lucrative the subsidies were, but also the type of subsidy that was available. So because these were covering OPEX rather than CAPEX and were long term um, that, you know, these organizations were having to go out to the market and identify and um, corp finance but also they were able to because the f f uh, investors were looking at this and saying well 
you know, I quite like the idea that you've got a 20 you know, year or 25 year uh, long term subsidy. And we can see here the four case studies that we, we covered. Uh, Green Energy Mull, Edinburgh Community Solar Cooperative, Green, uh, Gwent Energy and Brighton and Hove Energy Service Company. You can get a sense of just how much of their revenue was tied up in subsidies. So with uh, Green Energy Mull, 79% um, uh, of, of their turnover, the year ending 2018, um, just from the feed-in tariff uh, alone. Uh, similarly, Edinburgh Solar Cooperative, 60%. Where, where we see a much lower proportion, those are from organizations that um, have already diversified their business models. So the bottom two there, whilst they uh, certainly have uh, involvement in um, power generation through things like solar PV, rooftop, um, they do a lot of other stuff. Uh, much of it is actually beyond the meter. And what we mean by that is, um, for instance, installation of energy uh, savings, uh, energy saving measures. Now, if we remove these guarantees, um, that um, the, the analysis from our Nature Energy paper, again, linked at the back, suggests that only 22% of our sample would continue to generate a surplus. So if you remove the feed-in tariff, you remove the renewable heat incentive, um, only 22% would generate a surplus versus 92% um, of projects in 2018 where, the surp where these measures were in place. Now, the other point here is that the 22% that still generate a surplus, they may not have been able to secure the finance in the first place without having these policies, because simply the fact that the investors would would not would be viewing a different investment proposition. So there's kind of a, a, um, a, a, a dual impact of removing these, these policies. And it's not just the amount of finance or even the type of finance that's available. It's how this finance is linked together as a finance chain. So many of you, no doubt, um, involved in this space or others, you'll understand that you know, different types of finance will, will suit different uh, stages of development for an organization. Um, and what we found is actually this finance chain was pretty well linked up in places like Scotland uh, and Wales, where there were feasibility grants uh, for, for early stage in identifying the, the value of this project. There were bridging loans, um, which could be written off your soft loans if, if the project didn't actually go to full, uh, you know, to full deployment. Um, and then there were other forms of sort of larger scale, cheap state backed finance uh, for, for project deployment. The UK government, so I'm kind of looking at England here, uh, not so much. So not not very well linked up at all. And this is where we we heard um, we heard a number of uh, concerns, I think, from community organisations and those involved in the sector, that they they were sort of moving through this chain and and hitting up against a, a brick wall as as they did so. So so big scope for England to think about this in a more sort of coordinated uh, and and holistic fashion. The other development that we saw as the subsidies were starting to um, be withdrawn, the sector was becoming more challenging. Uh, there was a stronger focus on trying to identify finance from other sources is that we saw these intermediary organizations start to emerge. So organizations like Energy for All, Communities, communities for Renewables, and these emerged to fill very much you know, a demand amongst this sector where they wanted to engage with organizations that could provide some legitimacy through an existing track record. So instead of you know, a, a community organization doing this for the first time, they could partner with, with one of these intermediaries who'd done it 30 or 40 times before. And therefore the, the proposition to investors was uh, more compelling. Um, industry connections. Um, so we, we know the supply chain, we know who can do this for you, we can vouch for them access to an investor community. So these intermediaries would typically have, many of which were community organizations as well, um, would have an investor community they could readily call upon to fill any finance uh, shortcomings in, in their project portfolio. So um, they, one of our sort of interviewees basically said, you know, I can just pick up the phone and make a few calls and we can secure, you know, a short um, uh, shortfall in, in finance. Um, expertise to develop a credible business model so they know what works because they've done this a uh, number of times before and crucially for these community organizations particularly the one that I work for for instance it's uh, South Seas in Glasgow um, you know if we were to look at these kind of projects well we would be looking 
to somebody to do the operations and maintenance, somebody who knows what they're doing and somebody to take the burden off the community and to do a professional job on that front. Community groups on average source twice the amount of finance through these intermediary platforms. So um, whilst we identified that it was uh, more expensive when you see this in the, in the bottom um, bullet point here, to bring in finance through these intermediaries, you were typically able to get a much bigger um, pot of money um, in engaging with them. And then, you know, of course, not only was it a little bit more expensive that they would they would charge um, an admin fee for doing so. So, you know, obviously there's a quid pro quo. And I think the, the final thing before I, I, I maybe start to move on to um, some recommendations. The other big thing that we found, uh, and I, again, I, I hark back to that, that analogy of, kind of you know migration into new territory um the evolution of community energy business models so there was this mass experimentation this i don't want to use the word panic necessarily but this urgency to move into a new territory to still be able to monetize uh, the community energy services in a low or even a zero subsidy world now the really fascinating thing was is that those organizations that were able to pivot the best were those with fairly healthy reserves and those were the ones who were already able to secure um, the feed-in tariff and other analogous subsidies through um, renewable generation projects so we we looked at examples like um, gwent energy uh, here which put together an ev charging um, um, initiative so they, they they own a number of chargers and they they generate income from these in, in the local community. And also Brighton and Hove Energy Service Company that operate a pay-as-you-save model. So don't worry, I'll pay for the measures in your house. Um, and when and, and um, the project costs and the interest uh, costs will be covered through those savings, plus we'll make a little bit back. And then af once we've paid everything off, you keep the measures. So these are two, two kind of quite alien business models to the community energy sector um, but these organizations were in large part able to pivot because they were already drawing in money through subsidies through these rooftop solar um, installations typically so um, they were able to experiment with these beyond the meter services and what we've seen these community energy organizations do is try to stack these revenue streams um, which on the one hand solves a problem by de-risking your business model from any one particular policy change so generation subsidy gets thrown in the bin don't worry i've got three or four of the revenue streams um but of course it adds adds complexity and um i'm not going to bother with this this slide um at all but I, I um what what i want to just emphasize there is that this this transition which is which is evidenced by this extremely complex slide here this this transition is contingent on these organizations having the experience and skills also the confidence and indeed the, the the reserves to make this transition and those that uh, are unable to do that such as um so you know particularly good example would be a, a community looking to set up its own organization a new one which didn't already have uh, receipt of these subsidies didn't already have a track record in this space will they face a real challenge versus the same community trying to do something for renewable generation 10 years ago there's a significant lack of early stage grant funding and also state sponsored sponsored support like skills programs for these communities to tap into to even just kind of kick the tires and sense check that these business models make sense for them um, and and then to be able to skill the community up to, to help. Um, hence why these intermediaries are, have been so popular. And of course, from the perspective of investors, um, many of you will, will be in this in this bracket. Uh, this is a you know, high risk proposition to these investors um, because they're completely new and they're, they're relying on these communities to, to deliver these. So I want to end, I think there's, I think it's three slides left. So. Um, I want to end a couple of slides looking at what government can do and then final slide looking at what maybe you know the finance sector private sector can do to uh, um, address some of these issues so the first one obviously you know if if we see a value in community energy delivering a just transition in the context of um of a net zero transition 
then th there is clearly value in, in reinstating some of these price guarantees. Now, um, there is a, uh, the, the successor to the feed in tariff is the community energy generation. Um, sorry, the, um, the, the, uh, the, the sorry not the, that's our suggestion that there's a there's a the successor to the the feed-in tariff um is a sort of export guarantee which um is really there is no minimum term there is um there's no minimum uh tariff level either and really versus the feed-in tariff it, it is nowhere near as lucrative so there is a question mark about if these communities can generate electricity at low carbon and create some kind of community benefit through a community benefit fund where they capture the surpluses surpluses from is there room now for a community energy generation tariff and this as i said would demand some kind of evidence of long-term community benefit number two um low or zero interest loans so you know i think typically particularly from our case studies we found that these organizations had a real headache trying to secure um, uh, loan finance on commercial terms, particularly for smaller projects and where they could, maybe the, the, the cost of finance wasn't, uh, wasn't appropriate. And so that there seems to potentially be, you know, a big opportunity um, in the context of these reductions in, in subsidy and an increase in the kind of headroom for state aid. Um, that there may be an opportunity for low or even zero interest loans that are be below commercial rates for these organizations to to take advantage of analogous to the, the salix loan scheme in the in the for local authorities and, and public bodies and you know one one idea might be to this, any surplus generated from these low interest loans versus the the, the zero interest loans once various administrative costs are covered that these could be reinvested into um, into very low income areas uh, where community energy may struggle to flourish because they don't have the disposable income to draw in as community shares. So here we could have a very targeted scheme to help these, these more deprived communities. Uh, grant funding for energy efficiency. Um, so communities, as we've said, have long cross subsidized energy efficiency works with surpluses from renewable uh, generation and Crucially, um, the pay as you save model, where you are basically splitting the savings on somebody's bill, some between you, the organization, and some between the, the, the consumer, these don't work for the fuel poor because they're unable to pay their bills as is. So it would be you know, immoral um, to, to be taking any, any share of that as income to the organization. So how do we how do we make this work? Well, really you know, government needs to step in and, and provide targeted grant funding for these energy efficiency solutions and community organizations are extremely well positioned to deliver retrofit to these hard to treat homes and i see this day in day out not only through the research that we've conducted but through my engagement with uh, community energy organization in glasgow where these body these organizations are very very trusted and there and that is absolutely critical to gaining access to people's homes where often we, we don't necessarily want to open open our homes up to these disruptive measures um so i'm looking now at wider support um i think one real opportunity for the community energy sector is for some imposition from central government uh, around the importance of um local civic energy partnerships. So these partnerships are critical for things like joint funding, access to land and buildings, uh, complementary expertise. Um, and where there is some um, mandating from central government on public bodies like local authorities or non-departmental bodies uh, like the Forestry Commission to deliver against and present key performance indicators against a just transition. So things like carbon emissions reductions plus community benefit this creates a space for partnership and we can see here on the right hand side where for instance in green energy mole they're able to build their micro hydro scheme because of a partnership with the forestry commission and because that forestry commission had a focus on uh, on reducing environmental impacts through carbon emissions they were inclined to lease that land to them for this and similarly, um, the Edinburgh Community Solar was able to engage with local schools and use their rooftops as a, as a source of electricity generation. Um, because again, there was a shared appetite 
um, between the school, um, not only financial because they, they enjoyed some of the benefit from, from cheaper electricity, but because they, they understood the community benefit. If, if we can start to mandate bigger organizations to look at this, I think it really creates a space. Um, and I've, I've covered off the, the second point there as well. So this is the final government slide before we, we talk uh, the final slide. So um, one thing that started to, to happen that we, we've identified uh, through our research was that communities were using, um, starting to draw in grant funding for uh, technology demonstration because there's a big chunk of money available uh, for that um, more recently through things like the UK Industrial Strategy and that communities were often partners in these schemes. For instance, the Green Energy Mull um, case, they, they were part of a, a project called the Access Project, which looked to link their hydro scheme to um, community electrical heating, and, and it would do so smart. So whenever the hydro was charging, it would heat the homes uh, locally. And um, the issue with this is that this, whilst, whilst lucrative and whilst very experimental, the funding is quite short lived and often the communities are left reeling at the end of it without any long term benefit, um, even though they've put themselves in the position of high risk to to essentially um, host this the, these kinds of projects. So we, we need to look at responsible innovation. And I think communities could actually be at the forefront of this innovation drive if, if we treat them with respect. Um, I've already talked about the onshore wind issues. Um, Whilst the CFDs, the contracts for difference, are opening up to onshore wind, the planning uh, landscape is is still um, extremely hostile in England. And also, um, the CFDs are for utility scale, so really big projects typically, um, not really set up for two or three wind turbines in a community field. So this this needs to be be looked at. And finally, uh, UK-wide community energy strategy and body. Um, in short, there needs to be some coherence, some coordination um, across the UK as a whole, because Wales is doing something different to Scotland, is doing something different to England, and all of which um, adds to a, a murkier, more complex landscape. So a bit more of a targeted slide, I think, to this audience, I hope. Um, what can the private sector do? Um, I'm, I'm hoping, and I'm seeing this across the piece in terms of the investment community, bigger focus on ethical lending um, uh, and also ethical borrowing, that I think I'm hoping that there is more of an appetite, and I'd be interested to hear more from you about this, an appetite in terms of lending towards just transition projects. So these are zero carbon or, or, or low carbon projects that provide some demonstrable community benefit both socially and economically and if these tick the box then i think you know large banks and other investment funds should be targeting these um uh, uh, in in the in the short to medium term i think there's also a need for the coming together of the finance sector and the, the community energy sector or even lo local energy sector about understanding from the investors perspective what they want and require and i'm not sure having been a bit of a sort of voyeur in this in this space over the last few years i don't think that um that conversation is happening at the level it might and i think the community energy sector would would benefit from hearing more from the investor investment sector about what they want um if there if there can be some, some agreement around this i think what what um, the community energy sector is crying out for is some long-term patient capital relatively low interest loans, but low risk loans to, 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 to the investor. And we're, we're seeing this at a sort of household basis in Scotland through the Home Energy Scotland scheme. Um, one of my colleagues was emphasizing in the development of these slides that actually pension funds could be a really interesting space for this, who would seem to be you know, obvious suitors for these long-term uh, low risk investments. Um, and again, I, I welcome feedback on that. I think the investment community obviously has the ear of of um, of government, not least the chancellor. And I think there's a real opportunity there, if if the investment community see this as a as a potentially growing uh, space that has the potential to grow, to then lend their voice to the need for these price stability tools like long term revenue streams, um, to say, well, if if these were in place, these would be sufficiently de-risked that we would invest. And finally, education. So. 
to become better informed. Uh, I've spoken a moment ago about the community energy sector being formed by what, what you require as an investment community. But, but ditto, I think there is an opportunity for the investment finance community to learn a bit more about what a community energy project is, to help demystify it and reduce uncertainty around that. And I think there are some organizations in, in, in that sector who've really stepped into this, this area, the likes of Leapfrog, uh, Tridos, Thrive Renewables, uh, larger lenders like Santander. And I think there's maybe an opportunity for lesson learning here um, around what the, the value, but also you know, the potential drawbacks of, of doing so is. Um, and some of this may, you know, targeted uh, placements or comments may really, really help. So to conclude, um, I, I think it's important to emphasize that the, for community energy, the focus is on delivering a just transition as well as a net zero transition. And I think, I think it has a potentially very powerful role to play to be to putting control um, and ownership back into the hands of, of communities. And when I say ownership, I mean people taking ownership for this transition and actually feeling like it's, it's their responsibility. And I think we require that to make the harder changes. We've seen community energy has stagnated in recent years and communities have you know, entered this brave new world where finance has become harder to secure in the light of policy changes. Um, and this has severely compromised the traditional community energy business model. So communities have reacted by being uh, quite agile and innovative. And there are a number of exciting new ways of, of monetizing these projects and also financing these projects, but many of which are, you know, I guess in the eyes of investors are unproven. And I think there's a real opportunity for, uh, you know, a, a coalition of the willing between the finance uh, community and the community energy sector to come together and identify, you know, what, what one another require to make this, uh, make this sector a success over the coming years. So I thank you for listening. Uh, there are, there's further reading here, um, and I would probably point you initially to the Nature Energy paper, um, which gives an oversight of the survey. And if you want a bit more detail, sort of qualitative detail around the case studies, then I point you towards the UKIRK blog here, and which, which covers off these, these four case studies. So thank you very much for listening, and I look forward to your questions. Okay, Heather, do you, do you want me to hand over to you here? Yeah, sure. If anybody's got any questions, please just use the Q&A function to submit these um, and we'll try our best to answer them. I'll just give it a couple of minutes and we'll see if we get any. That's fine, questions. yeah. Okay, can't see any coming through. If you think of a question you'd like to answer after the webcast, please feel free to email Matthew on his email below or email myself and then I can pass these on. Matthew, do you have anything else you want to say before I close the webinar? I don't know. As I say, happy to field questions and contact details are below. Also, um, the team who are with me and also those who couldn't dial in, be happy to feedback. So thank you for listening. Um, yeah, and, and by all means, get in touch. Thank you. So I'd just like to thank Matthew, Ian and Ed for providing such an insightful webcast and of course to our listeners as well. For members of the Chartered Bank Institute, today's webcast can be recorded as part of your ongoing CPD.
Please remember to record this via the logbook in the members area of the website. We would love to welcome your feedback on today's webcast. And as Matthew mentioned, I'll also be sharing the slide deck with you all after this. Thank you for participation and thank you for listening. Thank you. Thank you very much.